Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast, bringing you worldwide experts from all areas of health and fitness. We cover training, nutrition, coaching, and mindset. Welcome your host, strength and conditioning coach, 2012 and 2013 CrossFit Games champ, Michael Cashew. Mind, body, brute. Hey, and welcome back. My name is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I'm back on the show with my good friend, Mike Bledsoe. Mike is the CEO of the Shrugged Collective, and he's a podcast junkie. He's the former host of the Barbell Shrug podcast and current host of both the Bledsoe Show and the Strong Coach podcast. On today's show, we dive into coaching coaches. Mike is, has gone through a new evolution in his career, and he is focused on helping coaches become better leaders, better teachers. Uh, we talk about the difference in uh, coaches and trainers. We talk about how to provide, or not provide, but create clarity in your life, how to really, really get clear about where you want to head and why you want to head there. We talk about how to build trust, how to listen better, and how to get better results for your clients or anyone that you are working with. Mike has been one of the most influential people in my personal life, uh, as well as my business life over the past number of years. Uh, he's someone I really look up to from a leadership perspective, but also in the way that he uh, approaches his own personal development. Uh, I learned a ton from this one, and I know you will too. Enjoy the show. Mike Bledsoe, what's happening, dude? Yo, yo, how you doing? Doing good, man. I'm excited to be back on the show with you. You're one of my favorite people of all time, and you've gone through a yes. a lot of, uh, you know, don't let that go to your head too much. Um, I've got a lot of favorite people, but you've, go <laughs> you've gone through uh, a huge transition in the past year or so, and I just want to touch base with you, see what kind of knowledge we can download from you. So you're developing yeah. uh, a new coaching prog program called The Strong Coach. So today, I want to talk all about your evolution as a coach, what it means to be a good coach and a good leader, and I think you're one of the best people to do that. Um, in the CrossFit and functional fitness, really the fitness industry in general, I would. It, it seems like they're like 90% plus of the quote unquote experts out there are trainers rather than coaches. And people really just don't know what it means to be a good teacher, what it means to actually coach. And so I really want to dive into that with you today. So first, let's start out with your evolution as a coach. How, how did you start in the fitness industry and just kind of take us high level over how it changed for you over time? Yeah, I, um, it, whenever I start thinking about how long I've been in the industry, it started when I was 14 years old and I was not allowed to be in the weight room uh, until I was 15 uh, and my parents wouldn't take me and they wouldn't let me in and when I so I did a bunch of reading uh, between the age of 14 and 15 so I, I was doing a lot of research when I finally got in the gym when I was 15 by the time I was 16 I was I was con uh, convincing my mom to come to the gym with me. She, she was doing, she was going on walks and she was doing all this stuff for her fitness and this and that. And we had, we all had a family gym membership, but she didn't know what she was doing in the gym. But I had read so much about what I was, you know, about my passion. I was, uh, I was really digging into that for myself and I couldn't stop myself from wanting to share that with my mom. Right. And so, um, yeah, my first client was my mom and she was very coachable. Nice. Yeah. She's nice. very, very coachable. And so, yeah, there was a period of time where I would wake up at when I was 15, 16, I, you know what? I remember it was when I was 15 too, because I, that's how I got to the gym early in the morning is I couldn't drive yet. And so I would, uh, go to the gym with my mom at 6 AM and then she would go walk around the track while I lifted weights. And then she would come in for the second half of my, my lifting session. And I would teach her how to lift the weights um, alongside me. And so that was really my, my first client. 
and uh, my only and I trained my friends uh, throughout high school. I ended up um, I, I went in the Navy when I was 19. And so um, for the first couple of years, um, I trained with friends there and, and all that. But I ended up when I was in the Navy being in charge of the physical training for my division. And so I ended up leading, you know, like teaching those guys what to do and, and how to do it. Um, and but I didn't really see myself as a coach. I was simply the guy who knew more than those other people mm-hmm. at the time. And I, I wasn't really working on my skills as a coach. It was, okay, I, I'm passing on this knowledge, but I didn't, I didn't think about it as a skill to master in itself. It was something that I was just doing. Um, and then I, and I thought that I knew so much because I definitely knew more than other people when it came to training. And I get out of the Navy and I go to the University of Memphis. And I, while I'm at the University of Memphis, I discover that there's a such, there's a such thing as exercise science and kinesiology. And I go, oh, you can study this stuff as academically in a degree setting. I go, this is awesome. So I signed up for that, I left business school, went and got for exercise science. And when I was there, the, um, I, my very first class was weightlifting 101. And I remember thinking, well, pff, I don't. Wait, I know how to lift weights. Mm-hmm. Like I teach this stuff to people all the time. You probably and I show up and 500 times, 500 different you, days in the military. For sure. hundred <laughs> percent. Well, you know what? I, I was really, really fortunate is, um, I had, uh, when I was in my teens, bodybuilders, there was a lot of bodybuilders that were my idols, uh, at that time. And I never skipped leg day. Nice. So I'm, like I'm actually, Coleman. Yeah, well, no, this was – Ronnie Coleman was big when I was there. But I, I remember thinking of guys like Frank Zane, the classics, so the classic bodybuilders. And so the um, – um, even when I was in high school, I was studying endocrinology, hormones, and things like that. So I knew that skipping leg day was, was not good, and you should definitely do back because you got to work the big muscle groups. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, I, I'm very, very fortunate. I, I've gotten lucky in that I've – I've read the right things at the right times in my life. I always squatted full depth, so nice. <laughs> and never and never skipped leg day. But is that is I get, that why, I get, what stunted your growth? Is that why you're so short? That's exactly what's going on. Started squatting heavy at such a young age. <laughs> Shit, man, dude! I wish I'd lifted earlier because now the studies are showing that uh, people end up being taller if they weight train when they're young. Interesting. It's 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 the opposite. That's true because you're adding stimulus to the the structure. Right, you're stimulating more hormone output. Hormones, and then also the the idea that uh, pressure is pushing you down. Mm-hmm. You're it's a stimulus against you know you're increasing gravity, and so now you want to like push against it, and so there's I think there's a lot to say for bone growth too. Right. So bones bones are just like muscles; they they grow slower. So, um, yeah, funny you bring that up, but I, now I'm like, oh, a kid should be lifting weights for mm-hmm. sure. But I get in the university setting and I, I go, I know what the fuck I'm doing. And I get hint, we, we're watching this screen where people are doing snatch and clean and jerk. And I go, oh, I don't, I've never done this before. I don't know what that is. And next thing I know, I've got a PVC pipe in my hand. And I, for the first time, I didn't know what I was doing when in the weight room. And I was, I was, I'd been lifting weights for nine years at that point, And I was completely thrilled that there was something new to learn because right. I wasn't, I wasn't bored, but I was, I thought that I had figured it all out. And then typical 24 year old. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I know what I'm doing. And, uh, so I, I, I quit training everything else and I got into snatch and clean and jerk and I became a complete student and I really wasn't coaching at the time. I was, that was the first time where I was receiving all the coaching and I wasn't really giving much, uh, out, um, until and then a couple years later while I'm still in university, um, I open, I discover CrossFit and, um, one of my buddies who's in the Navy with me, he's a SEAL, he comes and visits me in 2006 and says, hey, uh, teach me how to do the Olympic lifts. I want to be, I got all the SEALs are doing this CrossFit thing now. And so I saw him do CrossFit. I watched him do it. 
I go, that is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> six months later, I'm doing it in, in my buddy's driveway and loving it and, uh, and uh, end up opening a gym. Now, when I opened up the gym, I, um, I, I didn't even think about it as, I was like, yeah, I'm going to show people, but I had no vision of what I really, really wanted. All I thought was I'll put a bunch of equipment in a space. I'll slap a, a sign on the front of the place. People will show up and I'll teach them how to do <laughs> snatching, clean and jerk. And I'll teach them how to do muscle ups and I'll teach them pull ups and push ups and all the shit. And so hardly anyone showed up. Um, uh, but <laughs> because what, I didn't what understand, year is this, by the way, 2007. Okay. Yeah, 2007. But, you know, I, I look back on those times and I think about myself as a coach at that time. And what I really wanted was a place for myself to train. I wasn't, I was, I still hadn't gotten to the point where I was pursuing coaching um, in a way that, uh, in, in that I was trying to get better as a coach. Mm -hmm. I was way more interested in being better as an athlete at that time. And, coaching people and teaching them how I do what I do was my way of paying, you know, staying in that world, staying in the fitness world, staying in the movement world, um, while doing my own thing. And it really, it really took me, um, quite a few years. I, I coached a few people who, um, went to the games and I worked with a lot of athletes and what I ended up finding out, oh, and then I was simultaneously, uh, coaching, um, and that was later on, but I'm simultaneously coaching in my gym. So I've got some athletes that I'm coaching remotely and I'm putting all this effort into the, the training program and I'm getting on the phone with them once a week, you know, the remote programming game, uh, for, for competitive athletes. And I remember doing all that work and working with these competitive athletes, but then also inside my gym, I have, you know, a 55 year old woman who I've been fighting with for six months to stop eating so much damn sugar. And finally she stops eating sugar, goes paleo, and is off of diabetic medication for the first time in a decade. And, uh, and her, her uh, oh, I think she doesn't care that I share any of this, but her well, son is her Alex Mack. So. Yeah, but her oh, son is okay. Alex Mack. So he, uh, so the, it was, I'm sitting there and I'm having, I have one of my athletes who's, you know, Alex is a weightlifter on our team and I've got his mom, you know, getting, having all this success with her health. And I had this moment where I realized I don't care about coaching people to the games. I don't care about, it was this big come to Jesus moment for me where I go, I really I get way more satisfaction out of what I was able to help Alex's mom with than I ever could. And that was, that was a huge shift for me. That was a big step in my evolution as a coach where I really, even though I had never been in a position myself, I know a lot of coaches, they used to be overweight or they had some type of health problem and they found fitness as a way to help them. Um, I, I think I'm different than most coaches in that, I never really had a, a weight problem. I never had, um, I didn't use fitness. I, I definitely use fitness out of insecurity for a long time, but I don't know what it's like for a lot of people who are coming in the gym. And for me to have been able to watch somebody have a transformation where they're losing weight, they're gaining self-confidence and they're getting off of their medication. That was such a huge win that that was, uh, it was around that time that I, I lost interest in, in uh, coaching competitive athletes. And I, and I still have done it over time here and there. And it, it all depends on uh, where that athlete is mentally, if, if they're really well put together. And I, and I know that they're training um, not out of insecurity, but because they have real passion and it's really easy for me to coach them. But the people who I really want to help the most is, you know, when I look at the entire planet and especially the United States, I see a real problem. So as a coach, a lot of my effort now is in to uh, that. That's when I started asking myself, how could I communicate better? Why did it take me six months to get this person, you know, to give up all the carbohydrates and all the, the sugars right. so that she could 
get there. And whereas, why am I, I'm, I'm while I'm simultaneously getting in, um, it's like, I have like, uh, the conversations I'm having with high level athletes are also not amazing. It's like, they're not doing exactly what I told them to do, but I'm also with the person who's, uh, really overweight or really needs, um, help just with their health. It's like, it took me six months to convince her. I've got athletes that aren't adhering to exactly what I'm saying. And I, and I started studying communication because I realized I was like, man, I can, I've spent so much time trying to figure out how to write the perfect program for this high level athlete. And I'm also giving this person who needs help with their, just their health and just, um, keeping their blood sugar down. And both people were having a hard time hearing what I was saying. And so I started studying communication and that's when I realized that I also went to a conference around that time where they said, um, you know, if you're, how long have you been studying fitness? And I'm sitting there thinking, I've been studying fitness for over a decade. It's like, how long have you been studying business, communication, all this stuff? And I go, oh, not at all. And so I really, it really just highlights me. I go, okay, the thing that's keeping me from helping my clients more has nothing to do with the training program. It doesn't really have anything to do with, um, with really what I'm telling them to eat. It's all on the psychological side. What is this barrier? Why don't they hear me? Why am I not hearing them? And that was, uh, that was a big step for me. And that was around, um, a lot of that was around between 2009 and 2012, where I started really thinking about coaching differently. And I still had a really hard time around it. I still had, uh, for years, I wondered like why people, I got, I was really good at coaching movement and I was really good at coaching a class, but as far as getting clients to live a better lifestyle, that was, that was a big challenge for me that it took me years to, to figure that out. So you made this huge transformation from just wanting to work out for yourself to wanting to teach people movements to wanting to make a deeper impact on people that have a, the most to gain. And now I think you've made yet another transformation, which is uh, working with people not only on their on the physical side of their life, right? Not just fitness and nutrition, but also their mindset, their the, the long term vision for their life. As far as I know, you're not doing much like in person um, physical coaching anymore. Now you're moving on to this other stuff. Can you talk just briefly about uh, where where you've gone in the last couple of years and why that type of work is so important to you? Yeah, it, it's um, it was back in uh, 2013, and when um, I started doing uh, business coaching as well you were i might know a little <laughs> you bit were a part of that yeah. yeah and so so i was like oh i'm gonna do this mastermind thing i know about a lot about business and i think i was approaching the business coaching the same way i had originally done the athletic oh, coaching i go i want to i want to help people i know all this stuff and i, I do want to i really want to help you i'd already gotten to the point where i want to help people who I go, oh, they're really good at this thing, but they're not great at business yet. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to do business coaching. And as I started working with clients for business coaching in the mastermind environment, I realized I was I was hitting similar issues where I go, you know what? If you read a handful of business books, you will have a blueprint of what to do. But most business owners, especially gym owners, for some reason, aren't even doing the things they know they're supposed to do. So we're in the same situation where I go, okay, how can I communicate better? And so I'd already made improvements there. So by the time I'm in this business environment where I'm coaching business, I had already made those improvements. And then I also had a, a leadership coach myself. So I'm getting, I'm having leadership coaching. I'm coaching entrepreneurs. And then I'm also uh, helping our coaches when we have all these training programs with Barbell Shrugged online. So I've got a lot of coaching going on the whole time. But I, I started connecting some dots and I even took a, I took a break from coaching. I shut the mastermind down for a while. Still, still is not operating. Um, and it, because I want to get away from coaching people directly. And I took a break from everything because I wanted to, it, I need to hit the reset button. Mm -hmm. And when I, um, 
in, in taking that break, I ended up really digging deep into more of the what, what's funny is I went on a path where I was doing a lot of personal development personal development myself, leadership training, communication training, things that I was simply curious about because um, because I wanted it for me. I wanted it for my own life. And then um, I end up um, – and, and another thing that – I'll throw this in there. Another thing that really helped with um, – in my coaching career was doing the podcast because I had to learn how to present information that sold people on you should you should do this Mm -hmm. so starting with why why am i always i've gotten really good at explaining why are my why should you do the thing i'm telling you to do right and if you explain the why as you go every step of the way people will start falling in line um but i i did i took a i took a a hiatus from coaching and i ended up uh, doing a lot of personal stuff and so what i've come back to coaching now and what i realize is is um, I, I'm not as interested in coaching the athletes anymore. Even the people who are looking for, you know, uh, or, who are really looking to care for themselves and get off diabetic medication or something like that. Um, I really have fallen in love with coaching coaches. And so when I go around the fitness industry and I even, um, when we were hanging out a couple months ago and I, Ashley and I left Austin. I did three seminars on the East Coast. So we went into three different CrossFit gyms and we did seminars and we hung out with different people and we hung out with gym owners. And, and um, I, really, I really got um, present to where the average uh, CrossFit level one trainer is at. I go, okay, cool. That's where I was at. And I, now, I know exactly what it is that they need to do to take their skills to the next level because you know this as well as anybody else when we look around the the level of um weightlifting coaching uh now compared to five years ago is way better the average crossfit coach is really good at that Mm -hmm. but the interpersonal skills the the connection that the all the the other 23 hours of the day that clients may not be in compliance and also a lot of coaches they don't have a vision for where they want to be as a coach. All they know is I get my level one or I get my CSCS or something like that. And then I'll go get a job at a gym or I'll open a gym and only looking at what's going on around them and not really setting a personal vision for their own lives. So that's one of the things that I've real I've realized is so important is someone can come to me with a short term goal. Like, oh, I'm going to lose weight in the next 12 weeks to get in this bikini. Or I want to be – I'm a, I'm a coach, and I, and I think if I become a better coach, I'll get more clients. You know, and I need more clients to do this. And I think most people are coming um, – when they're hiring a coach, they're hiring out of pain and fear. They want to avoid something. I want to avoid being fat. I want to avoid um, – uh, you know, not having uh, enough clients, not having enough money. You know, I'm in pain in some way, and so um, for me now as a coach, in uh, where I'm at is I want to work with people. The very first thing we do is go, okay, let's get you out of this survival mindset mm-hmm. where it's like, oh, I'll, I'm just trying to survive. I'm just trying to make enough money. I'm trying to get my body to look a certain way so my husband doesn't leave me. Let's get people out of the survival mindset and get them into a creation mindset. And I really like pulling people out of uh, that survival mindset by getting them out of their typical environment and then also giving them a lot of time to consider where where they want their life, what they want their life to look like and where they want to be in 10 years. And when you really sit down and go and you ask somebody, what's your 10-year vision? Most people are going to look at you like, no idea. Mm-hmm. And so now when I'm working with somebody, I until we get the 10 year vision down for their life, there's no point in doing anything together. And so as a as a coach, now the my my big thing is I want people to be empowered for their own life. They I want them to not be looking outside of themselves for the answers. Mm-hmm. And I want them to be able to find the answers within themselves because I want to coach people to the point where 
they don't need a coach to do the to to start doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's one version of coaching, and I know we're both familiar with this. There's one version of coaching where you're holding the hand. And I still do that with people sometimes because the path to to empowerment where people are feel like they can take action on their own without somebody holding them accountable constantly. You know, it takes some time to get people there sometimes. Some people I can have a couple calls with them. I can have a couple call, co- uh, coaching sessions. Boom, they're already on the edge. They already get it. Some people they are starting at a different point in the conversation. But my goal is not to have to be on the phone with someone every week or having to have a touch point with them every week for them to do the thing they want to, the thing that they need to do to start reaching their goals. Mm-hmm. But creating and, and teaching people and guiding them to a place where they they trust themselves so much that they're action takers. They take action day after day after day. And so um, the, the empowering people and then not a, from a from a psychological perspective of going, oh, I can give myself permission. Oh, I have a vision of my own life to the uh, giving giving people frameworks and giving people like this is this is how you can create a schedule that works that helps move you towards your goals. So I'm really big on giving people empowerment and then giving them the tools to use it. But if I'm still coaching somebody in six months and I'm still having to you know, did you do the thing last week you said you were going to do, then I'm not, I'm not the coach. Um, then I need to fix something about my own coaching. Right. Like, why is this person constantly having to depend on me? Why do they always need permission from me? And so now where I'm at in my coaching uh, career and philosophy is I want to empower people to where they don't really need me. They, they may want to continue coaching to keep leveling up their game in a different way. But we're not getting on a call because, you know, I need to convince them that this thing is a good idea. It's more of a a guiding conversation. Right. What I love about the work that I've done with you in the in the business world, as well as just through conversations we've had and what I know you're doing with these new coaches is you're not you're not trying to put your own values and um kind of mission into these people, you're helping them uncover what it is that they truly value, what is their deepest purpose, if you will. And you've helped me in particular develop an extremely um, clear vision of what I want out of life. And I love that it's part that like people that work with you, they, they think that they want to just be better coaches, but what they get is they get to be happier. They get to be more confident. They get to be more purpose driven people. And that just so happens to trickle down to every single person that they work with. So you, you started to touch on clarity a little bit before. So you talked about this 10 year vision. I noticed when a lot of people think about a long-term vision like that, they, they tend to think in terms of achievements, right? I want to make X amount of Mm. dollars, or I want to get this kind of certification or distinction. Um, and I, and I've seen a lot of problems with that. How do you guide people through this 10 year process or any, any other things that you help them, uh, develop clarity around? Oh yeah. So, um, yeah, because that can be problematic, you know, achievement based goal setting only. Um, uh, it's, it's so surface level. So what, but it's something that people can grasp, you know, if we don't have achievement based goal setting, it's, it's even harder for people to even wrap their mind around what that is. So, uh, what I like to do, I, I really have an awesome process for this, which is I like to have people set achievement based goals. But what they say is my goal is because, and so they, they have to write the because. And so what's interesting is you, I've seen this with, uh, there's this one guy, he, he goes, um, uh, it's like, uh, you want to go, you want to go to regionals. Why? And they go, you know, it's a 22 year old guy answering why he wants to go to regionals and has no reason why. And I go, okay. Now he probably went home and two weeks later, you know, figured out why or realized that he didn't really want that. And he was going along and he goes, Oh, you know, 
I thought that girls were going to like me if um, if I was at regionals or something like right, that. Right. Um, but I really like people putting the because. And then what I do is um, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with achievement based goals. Um, but I do think that they can't be the only thing you, you've got going on. And so what I do is I take people's why and then we create um, a new identity around that. So this, this is very, very interesting. And um, this is a lot of work I've been doing with Mark England as well. We've been working side by side on some projects. Um, and the we owner got of Procabulary, for those of you who don't know, that he, he teaches about the power of language. Fascinating dude. Yeah. Yeah. And so a huge part of, so in order for people to achieve the things they want to achieve, say I want to make a million dollars a year, or I want to go to the CrossFit Games or whatever it is that I want to do, I cannot get to that achievement-based goal being the person I am right now. If, if I could get there being the person I am right now, I'd already have it. You have to become somebody new. So the majority, so in my goal setting, when I, when I sit with somebody, I go, look, where do you want to be in 10 years? Yeah, they may say all these achievement based things. And not only that, I help them dial in what's appropriate because sometimes people, it's like, is this your goal or is this the goal that was passed down to you by your father, by society? Do you think that this is going to make you happy? So on and so forth. But we get into the why their goals are the way they are. And you go, look, I want to impact 100,000 people because I want my kids to grow up in a world that's a better place than what I grew up in or something like that. And so what we do is I start creating identities for people and we go, look, this is your goal. Who do you have to be to reach it? And what's your why? And so, you know, some people go, oh, I want to influence people. I go, cool. So now let's create an identity that you influence people. Would you say that you influence people? And they go, wait, well, yeah, I influence people. I, you know, and a lot of times people have a hard time saying it. I go, okay, let's have you say, I influence people. People go, oh, okay, let me say that. Oh, I influence people. And that's a really, really simple um, mantra. So I'm really big on creating these very short, succinct um, phrases that people can have for themselves that trains the mind into a new way of being. So, um, so I'm real big on who do you have to be to reach that goal? What are those behaviors? So we go, look, Let's look at a 10 year goal. What has to happen in three years? What has to happen in one year? And what has to happen in the next 12 weeks to accomplish this? And if you know anything about program design, you know that that's how you write a program. Where does this athlete want to be in a year from now? We want to go to the games. We want to go to the Olympics. We got to look four years out. So like what, what behaviors, what habits have to be true today for you to start becoming the person that achieves that thing? But a lot of times I go, look, I want to. I want to make X amount of dollars. Okay, I need to impact that many people with my business to make that amount of money. What kind of person do I need to be? And and we always get to how can, especially when I'm working with coaches, is identities around service. And so it's it's all this stuff starts start surfacing when you start writing down your goals, like what do I want to do that? Oh, so I can impact more people. I can do I can be a more service in some way. So we start creating what ends up happening for a lot of coaches is they don't believe that they're at in service right now. Right. It when they may be like, one day I want to be of service, or one day I think I can make this kind of impact. And for a lot of people, it's realizing that they are making that level of impact with five people in their life right now. Mm -hmm. And how do we make that bigger? And and a lot of times the only thing that's standing between them and making a bigger impact is fear. So they're like, oh, I don't trust myself. I don't trust the words that are coming out of my mouth. I, I trust myself to share with five people. But what if I put you in front of 10,000 people? Do you trust what you're saying now? Do you trust yourself? And so creating an identity that is um, that creates competence in areas where people want to be competent you know, and I'm coaching coaches and the people who I'm attracting are the people who want to be great coaches because guess what? There's, you know, 200 people a week getting CrossFit level one certified. There's not enough gyms for all those trainers. And there's a lot of people who are, they want to make training their career. They want to make coaching their career, but, um, they're comparing themselves to everybody else. 
And so that's that's also a, a survival mindset type of deal. It's like, how do we get you out of how do we get you a place where you're not comparing yourself to other people? You're very focused on how you can help people. And so um, having an achievement based goal is can be really good things, but I, what I don't want is achievement based goals based on comparison. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I want to be, you know, and, and this is, this is really big in athletics is like, I want to be on the podium. I want to be in first place. Well, there's that achievement's different than I want to make X amount of dollars because the there's one achievement is based on comparison. One achievement, it doesn't matter. You know, you're going this direction or I want to, I want to impact a thousand lives. You go, okay, that's a great achievement based goal. That's not based on comparison. Now, if I say, I want to, I want to impact more people than Michael Cashew impacts. So now that's, now that's a toxic goal, right? So anytime we start going down this road of creating goals where we're comparing ourselves to someone else, you can never have compassion where there's comparison and compassion is going to be one of the biggest tools that a coach has a, a coach with compassion is going to make a much bigger impact than a coach um, who is living and, and motivating people out of comparison. One thing I really picked up on was how you're <clears throat> helping people really hack their their own stories that they're telling themselves about themselves. Oh yeah. So you have you're you're helping them create some clarity around what they want long term and be damn sure that they want it for themselves and they want it for you know it, it's something deep within them rather than just something in compared uh, in comparison to someone else or what they think society will think is cool or successful or their family so you make sure that 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 they're on the right direction can you talk a little bit more about especially just for people listening how can people start to become aware of their stories and those obstacles that might get in the way of them reaching that goal oh yeah oh yeah so the um and one thing i'll mention too is as i'm working with the clients that are in the program right now we're in our fourth week the first three weeks people were rewriting their 10-year goals and I think a lot of times people are afraid to commit to a 10 year goal mm-hmm. because they, for some reason they believe they can't change it. <laughs> hey, look, create the 10 year goal. And then after three weeks they go, Oh, that, that's not what I really wanted. That's what I thought I wanted, you know, after more reflection. So sometimes it, it takes it really weeks and like weeks a, of it's reflection. It's like a setting of the sights, right? It's not like a set in stone type of thing. We just need a direction to move in. So that's what it helps with. Right. And we can change that right. direction at any time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, and I, uh, it, I, I, I know it's true because I was doing it myself. I remember like, I don't want to set 10 year goals cause I don't know what'll be happening in 10 years. Right. Right. Who cares? Start moving in that direction for sure. Um, sorry. What was your question before I hijacked it a little bit there? No, I think I hijacked it. It was, how do you help people, um, or, or how can people oh, the stories. start to yeah, learn, like see what stories are holding them back and see what obstacles are getting in their way? Oh, wow. So, yeah, I do a ton of story work. And, um, man, there's so many stories that people are, that are running through uh, for them. You can, you can think about your life. So when you think about your life, think about your life as a movie. And there's a script. And everyone's – Everyone's playing these different characters and you have your own script. And what you'll probably notice when you look at your life um, is that the same script starts replaying itself as you get older. You go, oh, I seem to do like this in competition every time. Oh, I have this girlfriend or I have this boyfriend. And it seems to end the same way. I have the same feelings towards them near the end of the relationship. Or I'm getting in the same argument with this person or I'm getting – or. with my job, I keep hitting the same ceiling. I, as soon as I, as soon as I hit sixty thousand dollars in income, I, I seem to hit the cap there. And I think a lot of times, people, um, most of the time, what people do is they accept that story of who they are um, as true. And so, um, the there's a story going on for people that creates their lives. So if you can think about this, is <clears throat> Your thoughts create reality, right? And so anything that you do, you thought about it first. Any interaction you have before you speak, 
uh, there's some type of processing going through the mind that creates the words before they leave your mouth. And those thoughts are made up of words. And so language becomes very, very important. When you say these words, you get a picture in, in your mind. And that's what your mind focuses on. And that's where your attention is at. And that's where you'll start moving towards. And so uh, the trouble is, is that the majority of what your mind is creating is unconscious or it's your subconscious. And so what's happening is, is you learned a series of stories in your childhood. You believe that you were either smart or you were dumb. You, you learned that you're a winner. You, you learned that you're a loser. You learn that, uh, that nobody loves me, or you learn that um, that money is scarce, or you learn that I'm not athletic, or you learn that I am athletic. So <clears throat> there's all these stories that start playing out. And the thing is, is the more we study what's happening with the mind, the mind, what's happening with the mind and the emotions of the body are directing how the body develops. And so when we start thinking about even people who um, who continually lose. So I had the story of um, I, I had two different instances in my childhood where um, one, I decided that I was stupid. And there was another one where I decided I was a loser. And as I got older, I ended up I even I um, I haven't had the thought run through my head in a long time because I did some work to remove that pattern in my life but there was a pattern in my life that if i were to hit if i were to miss a snatch in training i'd go oh you're such a loser that that phrase would run through my head and what i ended up doing is i ended up merging those stories even where then it got to a point where especially when i was doing things in business and things didn't go my way in business i'd go oh you're such a stupid loser and i remember for a long time, that phrase ran unconscious. So I didn't, I, I didn't have the awareness that that phrase was running in my subconscious. So if you don't know this already in your subconscious, there's all sorts of things and language running around in the background, creating pictures. You notice if you close your eyes and you take a breath, the thoughts are endless, but usually we are distracting ourselves with something and you have these thoughts running in the background. There's these pictures and these words that are running through there. And so I became aware of, oh, I have this script that every time that something doesn't go my way, I tell myself I'm a stupid loser. So that's how I show up in the world. Now, I'm lucky because there's two ways of, of being in agreement with it. When a story is being told by your subconscious, you either agree and give into it and say, okay, yeah, I am stupid. Or you could say, or you might overcompensate. And so I'm fortunate in that I overcompensated because what I didn't do is accept I was stupid and then just go on about it. And the same thing with being a loser is I put forth a lot of effort. The, the trouble is, is I didn't, I didn't get to enjoy learning and I didn't get to enjoy competing because that was a script I was running off of. Um, and so, uh, your, the, the story that's running your life for the most part is unconscious, but as a coach, I can talk to you and we can, I, I go, oh, I can see what's going on for them. A coach is someone who can see things objectively and go, oh, this is, this is how this is working. So um, what I did is with, with those words, those, those common phrases that run through your mind that were running through my mind is I transformed them. I, I, I had to pull them apart and go, okay, am I stupid? No, I'm not stupid. Look at every, everything. Like I'm a very intelligent person. So I started, I, I threw a, for me, I went and rewrote those stories through NLP, hypnosis, and a few other uh, techniques where I was able to go back and rewrite the story of being stupid and then also being a loser. And then I replaced them with beliefs and I, a story that now runs through my head that is much more empowering, whereas instead of being a loser, my, my, uh, my phrase is, I win at life. And so it may sound very, you know, like unicorns and flowers and all this shit. But the, the truth is, is when I started living from a place where that was happening, the way that I showed up in the world started to shift. And I really believe that no matter what, that I'm going to win the situation and not that I need to beat anybody else, but that I win at life. So even if something doesn't go the way I want it to go, I'm like, Oh, okay. Now I'm the type of person because now I'm showing up in a much more positive way, 
really good things start happening. People start treating me differently. People want me to do well because I'm showing up in such a po uh, positive manner. And um, so th that's one example of how I've, I've experienced story in my own life and how it's impacted me. And then when I, when I shifted that story around even being uh, stupid to, oh, I'm an intelligent person who loves to learn, I then found myself reading different books, learning different things, and enjoying the process all the way through. And I'm learning at a faster rate these days than I used to learn because my story is different. And so, um, yeah, there's there's so much identity stuff. And, and I think what's really holding people back a lot of times, what was holding me back for a long time was I didn't, when I stepped into a room, when I stepped into a new project, a new business, I would question whether I was good enough to be doing this or not. Am I do I really belong? Should I really be coaching this class? Should I really be doing this podcast? Should I really be running this mastermind? And um, that that continual story popping up and having that fear for a lot of people, it completely shuts them down. They're like, oh, I'm not I don't think I'm the right person for this job. So I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. But what they don't know is that anyone who's doing that job is having the same thoughts. It's not your thoughts are not special to you. Your thoughts are, we all share the same mind. It's, it's the human condition. It's the, it's the thing like we, we think we're special, uh, when we walk around and we're, we're like, Oh, no one else is thinking that I'm like, Oh, I'm fat, you know, and everyone else thinks I'm fat. And it's like, no man, everybody is so wrapped up in their own mind right. and everyone's got their own stories and they're about who they are and who they are not. And a lot of um, a lot of our attention is on looking good to other people and going, oh, okay, I'm fat, so I'm going to worry about what they're doing. Not knowing that the person on the other side of the room is so caught up in their own story about who they are. And the people who are really successful, what they do, really believe that they are the person who achieves the things that achieves that does those things. And so, shifting identity and shifting the conversation that's happening in your head. Is, is extremely important. And that's only part of the story is, look, let's, let's create a story about who you are that's very empowering, but we need your body to believe it. And so a lot of times when we're shifting identity with people, I go, oh, um, I want you to say, I'm a great coach, or I want you, someone who's not a musician, they wanna start playing the drums. So instead of saying, I want to play the drums or my goal is to play is to play three songs by this date. I go, how about you try saying I'm a drummer or I am an athlete. And you know, you say these things and a lot of times when people go to say this new thing, they've never said about themselves. I'm an athlete. They may go, uh, I've watched people get shakes. I've watched people go, ooh, 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 not be able to get it out. And, or they really hesitate. There's something about, that identity that their body does not agree with. And so um, I use breath work as one way of downregulating the nervous system because what happens is when, when the mind creates um, a new identity, when you're trying to make that shift in identity, your body will uh, your body will disagree because it doesn't line up with what was in the past. Mm -hmm. So it creates a stress response. So now instead of when you're you in order for the body to learn anything new, it needs to be in a down regulated state. So someone you need to be breathing into your belly, you need a your body needs to be producing hormones that are conducive to neuroplasticity. Whereas something like cortisol and being in a, a stressed and, and shallow breathing creates cortisol, which which makes it harder for the body to learn new things and new skills and tasks. This is why when you're coaching an athlete in the gym, if they're stressed out and they're going, oh, I can't do it, they're not going to do it because their their nervous system is not in a, in a place where it can learn. So what I do is, okay, let's create a new identity. Let's create a new story about who you are. But now let's take some deep breaths and let's mellow out the nervous system. We get the system down regulated. Now the nervous system and the and the neurons can rewire in your head and in your body to agree with that story. So um, it's called socializing the identity. And so you may you may try to command yourself. And this is where mental toughness can can get tricky is because um, and I 
I the uh, the term mind over matter bothers me a little bit because some people have gotten so good at willpowering their body that it, what ends up happening is is they they do become very accomplished but in a stressed state. Right. And so they're very very mentally strong, but it's only going to last for so long. So mental toughness is only a gear that gets used when you need to plow through something. It's not a place where you live. So in order to take on these new identities, learn how to downregulate the nervous system, say these words to yourself and your body goes, oh yeah, this is true. I am a great coach. I am an athlete. And now what you do is you start living your life out as that person. And this is where um, focusing on your identity is better than focusing on the, the accomplishment goal or the achievement oriented goal because now I'm a great coach. What are the things that a great coach does? You know, a great coach would say this right now or a great coach would shut their mouth right now and listen to the athlete. And so what you do is when you take on a new identity, you know what to do. But the reason you didn't do it before is because you didn't believe you were the person that did that thing. Now we give you a new identity and you become the person who does that thing. Now the answer comes very easily. And so if you're curious as to whether you have conflicting identities, because there are parts of you. There are not, there's not a single voice in your head. You've probably noticed that sometimes there's a debate in your head and there's two voices. Now there's a third voice and you're going, what the hell is going on? This, this happens. Those are not, those are only parts of you that you learn from usually your parents, but you could learn them from somewhere else. You got a coach at some point, their voice is in there. And so when you start having these conflicting stories, um, it can cause, uh, if anyone has a hard time making decisions, someone's like, oh, I don't know what to do. That's because you have conflicting stories running in your head and you, you don't know what to do in a situation. So you don't have a strong sense of identity. Most people don't have a strong sense of identity or they have a really weak identity that gets pushed around by some of the other identities running around inside of them. And so, uh, what I like to do is pick the identity that I want for me in my life and, and go all in on it. And so anytime I look, look, this is, um, you know, I'm, I am, uh, you know, I'm a great showman would be, you know, one of my identities, you know, is like, what would a great showman do right now? And I go, Oh, a great showman would hop on stage and, da, 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 and, and even if they felt nervous, they would still, like, you know, be really charismatic and give everything they have. Whereas if I had confusion about my identity, I'm like, oh, you know, I'm just this guy. I'm just this or that. Now I don't step on stage. When I do, I'm a little shy about it. And so I still have conflicting identities inside of me. It's not like I chose my identity and I am that person all the way, all the time. I still, those other voices of, of um, uh, pop up that are... Um, trying to keep you safe they're, really they're in they're in doubt they're like right. oh i don't know if i really am that they are trying to keep me safe I'm like oh i'm in doubt that i could do this and then the other part of me is like no i'm gonna fucking do it you know i'm gonna really get after it and so i think that i think that it's a, all a practice and whatever voice that you agree with the most is the one that's going to dominate your life and so i really like getting people clear this is what i want to accomplish in 10 years who do you have to be? What does your identity have to say? What do you have to say about yourself from moment to moment for that to be true? And then what ends up happening is like, okay, we're, we are consciously choosing identity because most people are walking around with the identity that they accumulated over their entire life. And the people that contributed to that identity weren't very conscious of how they contributed to that identity. So now what we end up with is this big hodgepodge. And at some point you have the opportunity to wake up and go, fuck it. I'm going to choose my identity. It is my life. I'm not settling for anything less. This is who I want to be. And then really creating the statements for yourself um, and, and choosing uh, to be that person day after day. And so when I'm, when I'm coaching people, that is step number one is who is it that you actually want to be? Who is this? Who is this person? And I, I think over half the time I have people that they choose these goals and then we get into the identity piece and then they go, Oh, those really aren't my goals. And we go, cool. 
go back, rewrite those goals because they realize that they don't even want to be the person that does that. Right. It's like, oh, I want to, I want to make this amount of money. It's like, okay, well, this, the, the person that makes this kind of money is this way from your perspective. And they go, yeah. I was like, oh, I don't, I don't really need that. Mm -hmm. I go, cool. What do you really want? Who do you really want to be? And so we live in a really cool world where um, the way consciousness works is we have a choice. We have a choice on who we get to be and who we don't get to be. And most people will never wake up to that opportunity. Um, not the way things are going right now, but that's, that's one of the big motivations for me doing the coaching program is because I know that the fitness trainer, the, the CrossFit level, uh, level one trainer, the personal trainer in a gym somewhere, they have the ability to make that happen for their clients too. Because not only do I want to shift the identity of the coaches I'm working with so that they show it better for their clients, but I want them to be able to pass down this choice of identity to their clients. Because I don't think there's anything better that uh, there's not a better gift you can give somebody than the ability to choose who they are. Rather than being run on an old program that they didn't even come up with in the first place. I love the, the Carl Jung quote, uh, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will run your life and you will call it fate. Right. So that's super, <laughs> super powerful work that you're doing, man. I love that. What are a yeah. few of the, so it's obvious, it's obvious to me and hopefully to the listeners a little bit more. So, uh, after you explain that, how important the, the personal development piece is for coaches, what are some yeah. of the, I don't know, two or three of the skills, behaviors, uh, frameworks that you're teaching them to communicate better with their, their clients, their athletes? Yeah, so um, really teaching people what it means to listen. And so most people are listening from a place of um, wanting to agree or disagree. So you're sitting there and you go, do I agree or disagree with this person? Almost everybody does this. So if someone goes, ah, don't do that. So like really pay attention to the next conversation you have. And so most people are looking to agree or disagree. This is the same reason people watch um, their fate. They have a favorite news station because they want to watch the news station in which they agree most of the time. And so that feels people, good. yeah, it feels good to agree. Yeah. It also feels good to disagree. <laughs> yeah. Funny enough. Yeah. Keep going. And so, yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times what's happening is I'm, you know, you're sitting in a conversation and you're, you'll know if you're disagreeing, agreeing or disagreeing, but you go, Oh yeah, I'm going to agree with this person. I'm going to tell a similar story or I'm going to tell them that's not what I think when true listening is, is coming from more of what is this person feeling? What is this person thinking? What's important to this person? And when you're coming from a place of listening where you're trying to figure out what's really, what is this person's values? What is it that they think is important and all that versus do I agree or disagree or looking for an opportunity to pitch them my idea, but really listening. And so I have exercises that I have people go through where they, they sit down with their clients and it's like, you're not allowed to tell them your opinion for five minutes. Your only job is to ask questions. And I don't know how many people I I've had to do this, that man. exercise. I agree with this. Keep going. <laughs> they, do, they do five minutes of asking questions and not giving their opinion at all. And they're blown away at the depth that they, that they give with that person and what they find out about that person. It, I've watched people who have known each other for years do an exercise where one person asks and they go, holy shit, we never got that deep. It's five minutes. It's not five hours. It's not a weekend, you know, out in the woods together. It's a five minute conversation where you're only listening and not giving your opinion. So there's, for some people, as soon as that happens, they go, oh, got it. And for other people, it takes them some more time to figure out how to integrate that into their daily lives. So that's, that's one example of something that's extremely, extremely simple that I give coaches to teach them how to listen versus waiting to agree or disagree. That's such a, a first off, that's such a useful skill for any human being to have, um, and especially for a coach. And yet it's, it's probably the hardest for someone with the title coach or teacher, right? Because people are paying them or signing up or raising their hand to say, okay, I want to be coached by you. And sometimes 
all they want in that moment is for you to listen to them, right? In, uh, in the yeah. motivational interviewing world, they call it the writing reflex. Like if, especially when we're an expert in something and we see a way that someone could do something in a better way, uh, and we have like that, that upgrade for them, it's, it's almost like a, just an immediate reflex for us to try to show them the right way or to coach them up. Yeah. And so sometimes the best thing for a coach to do is not to coach at all, it's just to listen. That's a really powerful yeah. reframe. Yeah, and, and most coaches are over coaching. They're going, you know, I'm gonna give them 10 things to fix. Let's talk about one thing today and work on that for the week or two weeks or whatever mm -hmm. and see all the other stuff and then listen to the rest, right? Listen, listen, because here's the thing, as a, as a coach, my job is to find out the highest leverage thing that we could help you move towards your goal. My job isn't a, to, and I've got this methodology I wanna use on you. That, uh, it's, what is it that's gonna help you get to your goal? And the only way I can figure out what the highest leverage item for you is, is to truly listen. It's, it's, because it's gonna be different for everybody. Right, what's, a, what's one more thing that you're helping them uh, communicate with or, or build a relationship with their clients? Um, one of the big things is dealing with withheld communication. So they, um, everyone's got a client or clients where there's some type of drama going on or they're, they're not doing what they're supposed to do or it's a client that you like every time they walk in you're like oh hmm. I don't want to deal with this person so um, yeah I have a, a, a some some templates I have some scripts uh, where I teach people how to have hard conversations where it's you know it's like oh man I've let this slide for a year now this person keeps doing this I don't know how to tell them now I don't know how to approach this or I'm a coach who has a coaching staff and they're not, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. So I, I teach people how to approach a hard conversation where it goes back to listening even where, how do you, how do you create listening on both sides where it's like, okay, there's this thing I've been wanting to talk to you about, but I didn't know how to say it. Um, and bringing up those hard conversations and teaching people exactly how it works and then trying it out in email first. You know, there's, you know, doing it written is a lot easier. Practicing a new way of communicating written as email text is way easier than doing in a conversation because next thing you know, you get emotional and you say the thing that you didn't mean to say and all that kind of stuff. So um, a big part of what I teach is how to have those, those hard conversations as well. That's awesome. The, the, and I, I think this, one of the things you just said is really easy to overlook, but it's that introduction into the conversation, right? Hey, I've been having this thing. Like when a, a lot of people have asked me the same type of question, like I have this thing I want to talk to so-and-so about, but I don't know how to like even approach it. And it, just saying, Hey, I've, this has been on my mind. It's a really uncomfortable conversation and just going into it like that, that is perfect. Just identifying that you've been thinking about it and it's uncomfortable. And then the second piece is like, it's gonna get messy. Like you have no idea how this person is going to respond. You might be able to anticipate, but just be willing to allow it to be messy and, and get through it that way. That's a really, yeah. that's a really cool thing you're teaching. And I'll give a, I'll give a quick little how to is, for instance, I'll, an example of this person keep, never puts their weights away, right? They're, they leave the bar out with the weights on it and you know, you don't, maybe, maybe you've said something like, Hey, could you put the weights up or something like that? But for some reason, the person's not hearing it and they're not doing it. Um, and so what you do is you come to the person and you get very specific about the, the issue is a lot of times when people, something's bothering them about something someone else is doing is they go, Oh, they always do this. Mm -hmm. Well, nobody always does anything for one. And if you say, Hey, you always, or let's say, you know, we're hanging out and I'm at your house and I say, Hey, um, maybe you think, and Mike never does the dishes and I go, or Mike never puts his weights away and I go, okay, um, I'm going to get defensive immediately. I'm not going to hear anything you say from here on out. But if you go, Hey, yesterday afternoon, I noticed that the barbell in the 
and the uh, was out on the floor and it had the weight still on it. Um, do you recall leaving that out? And I'm going to go, oh, shit, I did. And so that's step number one is most people are not specific enough and and what the issue really is. And, and what most people language. do is they, yeah, they, they suppress it and they go, oh, he always does this. I don't even know how to bring it up to him. Or when I ask him to put it away, da, da, da. But maybe that person's putting it away half the time and half the time they're not. So they feel like they're doing a good job. But if you go, hey, yesterday, you know, when you do that, when you left that out, that meant that it, I had to put it up and I, that didn't feel good to me. You know, that, that, that made me feel sad that you didn't consider me. And so when it, it may sound a little, it may sound soft, but I tell you what, it's that type of communication that gets results because people go, oh, this is the, my action or lack of action. And this is the impact that's making on this other person. People care about other people, but you can only, you can only create that, that empathetic conversation through sharing vulnerably about the impact their actions are having on you. And so a lot of times ha holding that withheld conversation, having that hard conversation is more about saying, hey, let's be specific about the situation that I want to talk about. This is how it impacted me psychologically, emotionally. And it meant that I had to show up early to the gym to open up because I, because now I'm having to clean up your, the fact that you left your weights out before I can start teaching a class. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think the average athlete responds, the average athlete responds way better to that conversation than, hey, you know, put, put your weights up. Or, you know, what most people do, don't say shit and just, hold just suppress it and, right. and get mad over time. And then Walk next thing you know, off. people are getting kicked out of gyms. Yeah. Right. That's awesome, man. So as we're, as we're wrapping up here, um, What's the, what is like the, in, the long-term goal for these coaches that you're coaching? What, what can they expect to leave the programming knowing or, or being, or being able to do? No, knowing exactly what it is that they, they want out of their career. So having a very clear, like, oh, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this knowing exactly. And then knowing day to day what they need to do to move forward, because it's one thing to do your job. It's another thing to be progressing in, in, in your craft and mastering your craft. So, um, so they're going to have that. They're going to have the ability. They're going to get better results with their clients, because the truth is, is when you start listening to your clients and you, that communication is open and then also helping your clients see the bigger picture. I'm uh, teaching them how to integrate these conversations around having a bigger vision for your life into everyday conversations as you're training people. And so it gets people thinking more holistically about their own life. So they start making better choices. So getting the results uh, for your current clients, getting better results, deeper relationships with them. And what, it, what that enables as well is when you have a, a deeper relationship with your best clients, you now will, we, we start creating a conversation around how to get more of your favorite clients, the clients you enjoy training the most. How do you, now that we, we, we have a much more intimate relationship with the people we enjoy training the most, now we know how to talk to them and we know how to talk to people like them. And so now when I'm creating, when I'm doing sales, when I'm trying to get new clients, when I'm having these conversations with new people, I know how to have the conversation that's going to attract the client I enjoy working with the most. So one of the things I'm really interested in is the coaches enjoying coaching. And because I think a lot of times people feel as though they have to take every client that comes their way because they need to make them, they need to make money, mm -hmm. but they don't know how to replicate what it is they already enjoy. And most of the time, say I've got a hundred clients, I really enjoy working with five, but the other 95 are okay. And then there's, you know, a, a 10 of those who I really dislike. Um, so really getting clear on who you're serving. And I, I, I want the experience when someone sees, uh, meets with one of the coaches that I work with, you, you could be in a, in a, you know, I'm in San Diego, you can go to 50 different gyms within 10 miles of here and everyone's offering something very similar. You know, they're offering CrossFit or they're offering Zumba or Pilates or whatever it is they're, 
the, the thing that's going to make you stand out is your ability to connect with the clients because the average coach, the average trainer doesn't know how to do it. And I used to say when people go, oh, how do I differentiate myself in the market? I used to be like, well, figure out, you know, if there's no running coaches in the area and you're into that, then that might be a way. I used to think about differentiating yourself in the market based on skills. But now I think about differentiating yourself in the market by simply being the uh, the the coach that that helps their clients see the bigger picture, that gets their clients really amazing results, that has a really good relationship with them, where um, if anyone is is upset about anything, it gets cleared up right mm -hmm. away. It, there's a really positive culture. So I'm really interested in creating a culture in the fitness industry. I want to upgrade all the trainers and coaches to a degree where we're having a bigger conversation and it's not about just losing 10 pounds by bikini season or a wedding or something like that, but really building a relationship with a client and helping them live an empowered life themselves. And I think this is, this is the next evolution in the fitness industry because look, everyone's got movement. Everyone knows nutrition. Everyone's getting the rest conversation kind of, <laughs> um, and the rejuvenation conversation it's getting there. But really, I think that as, as, movement and program design, all these things become more commoditized, which is going to happen. More people have these skills than people who are buying. The thing that's going to make you stand out is your, is your interpersonal skills. I love it, dude. Mike, I've known you for a long time and you've always been one of the most like mission driven, purpose driven people I've known. And you've always had, um, just the, the best intentions with like how you approach um, working with people. And I've seen you have a, a profound impact on my life, uh, Adi's life, our businesses. Um, and I know that the work that you're doing is gonna have a huge impact on coaches and the entire industry. Uh, I know you're in the middle of your beta phase, you're, you're starting small. Where can people go that are interested in learning more, they wanna apply, how do they go about that? Yeah, so I'm opening up in the next few weeks. I'm going to be doing round two, and I'm going to let 10 more people into that program. And um, if you want to get on into the program, go to thestrongcoach.com, and you can get on uh, – there's an application and a wait list. And so I'll be opening that up in the next few weeks, and then my goal is by the end of the year – if you've been applying it on the wait list, you'll be the first to know when I open it up to more people. So I'm being very careful about how I do this, which is different than what I've done in the past. In the past, I used to be very aggressive and go, oh yeah, this is, like I built this, now have it, and then watch it break. Um, right, right. Which ev everything's gonna break at some point for sure. We all experience that as entrepreneurs and as coaches, but I, um, um, I'm being very selective on and very careful about how this rolls out because I want everybody to walk away with amazing results. So if you go to the, thestrongcoach.com, over the next six months, I'm gonna be opening it up to more and more people and getting it more and more dialed in. What's really cool about that is it's, a, it's an eight week program. And uh, in addition to the eight week program, you have homework to do, exercises to do, journal exercises. Um, there's real changes happening over that eight week period. Uh, for you and your clients and then also i have everybody in a facebook group where it, it's really cool to have right now i have six coaches in the beta program and it's six people who are interested in mastering their craft as a coach and so i'm really looking forward to that group getting bigger and bigger and bigger because when i have the next crew come in they're going to go in that group and i'm going to keep adding to it and i am really excited to have a community of coaches that are having a higher level conversation about what's really going on. And I think that um, this is going to breed a lot of success uh, for the people who are in that group. So if you want to find out more, there's two things. Obviously, go to thestrongcoach.com. But I'm also have a seasonal show, the Strong Coach, Coach Podcast on the Shrug Collective. So if you go to shrugcollective.com, every Friday I'm posting uh, for the next five weeks. There's eight shows total um, for the Strong Coach podcast. It's just a, a short season where I interview people on um, coaching. And I interview people who I think are extraordinary coaches that are doing um, this little stuff. 
uh, I interview you, Michael, and it's you're on there. Extraordinary. Um, truly extraordinary. Dude. Truly extraordinary. Only only the one percent, <laughs> and, and which is true. I I I've been traveling around the world interviewing people the last six and a half years, and I've gotten to know some amazing coaches. So what I did is I go look who are the best coaches who have had the most experience and who are the uh, who are also the coaches who are heart centered. And so I really wanted to get with heart-centered coaches and find out what it was for them that made the biggest difference. And so um, I, I've, I've had more fun doing the Strong Coach podcast than I've had with any other podcast in a while because it's so focused on getting better at this one thing that I love so much. And so uh, being at, if you really want to get some real gold, check out the Strong Coach podcast. So um, they can follow you on Instagram at the uh, fanny pack unicorn. That's right. The fanny pack unicorn. Now, um, Instagram is Mike underscore Bledsoe. I'm plugging my computer because now I'm I'm losing juice. Um, uh, Mike underscore Bledsoe for Instagram. And one other thing I want to mention is um, I've taken all the training programs that I've created over the last six years because now I'm moving into this new phase of coaching the coaches and really work on interpersonal skills. And we have years of training programs and different curriculum that we've built through Barbell Shrugged in the last six years. And we put it all in the one spot um, called The Vault. So if you go to shrugcollective.com and click on The Vault, there's a whole other Facebook group uh, associated with that as well. So if you're looking for a goal-specific training program, then uh, that's a really good, great spot. We're not selling any, we're not doing any more big launches of, of training programs for athletes. So we took everything that we used to do. Some of those programs are 18 months long. Some of them are only 90 days long. We packaged them all into one spot so you can get access to all of them. And how much is that? 47 bucks. 47 bucks. Y'all have, I, I know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, y'all, that's ridiculous. Y'all have charged like hundreds and hundreds of dollars for each one of those on their own, and now they're all available for forty-seven bucks. Go get it, guys. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, love yeah. It. yeah, yeah. That's a that's an enormous amount of value, and what I love about it is people can do different, like different programs for different phases of their life or for a bunch of different goals because you've got a ton of different yeah. types of training on there. Yeah, one might be the Muscle Gain Challenge, where that was the first program we ever put together. It's a very aggressive weight gain, you know, muscle size program. And then um, we've also got programs that are uh, they're shoulder programs. They make they give you better, stronger shoulders and safer shoulders too. So like a lot of times, people in CrossFit especially may get to a point like, man, my shoulders are shot. Well, we have a 90 day program. You add this on top of your regular training, and you'll have. Uh, stronger, healthier shoulders. So there's a lot of little things in there uh, too. So not just these 12 month programs, but these 90 day programs where they're very specific to solve um, a problem. Word up. Thanks, Mike. Guys, you can follow me at Michael Cashew. Uh, I don't post shit on there, but you can browse through (laughs) very old pictures of me. Um, Just some genius quotes. Mike, this was a pleasure, man. Dude, thanks for having me on. This episode is finished, but your training journey continues. Head over to BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW and grab your free pack of 32 accessory workouts that you can incorporate into your training and start improving your strength immediately. That's BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW. 